Okay, well, our first speaker then is Dr. Marie Coleman. Marie is a reader in modern Irish history at Queen's University, Belfast. She is the author of County Longford and the Irish Revolution, 1910 to 1923, which uh, is a book based on her PhD research in UCD. Her subsequent research has focused on the award of military service pensions, compensation awarded to civilians for personal injury and damage to property during the revolutionary period, violence against women during the War of Independence, and the Southern Protestant depopulation between 1911 and 1926. Her recent publications that relate specifically to Longford include the article Protestant Depopulation in County Longford during the Irish Revolution, 1911 to 26, which is in English Historical Review, and Demographic Change in Longford's Methodist Population, 1869 to 1926, published in Bulletin of the Methodist Historical Society of Ireland in 2020. And Marie will speak on guerrilla warfare in revolutionary Longford, 1920 to 21. So I'll hand you over to Marie. Uh, good morning, Martin. Good morning from Belfast, everybody. I hope everyone can see me and hear me properly. Um, OK, I'm going okay. to try. Uh, first of all, thanks very much to Martin and to um, everyone at Longford County Council and Heritage Service for organising this event. For those of us who live a distance away, I think this might well be the, the new way of participating in conferences when things return to normal. I'm just going to try now to share my screen because I have a number of slides that I want to speak to. So I'll, I'll just do that now and um, you can let me know, Martin, if this has, if this works properly. OK. Yes, indeed. That's fine, Marie. We can see that. You can see the just the, right. OK, that's fine. OK, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a start. So um, I want to start first just by outlining a chronology of the War of Independence generally and showing where Longford fits into that pattern. Most historians would follow Charles Townsend's schedule for the way the War of Independence played out, looking at the year 1919 as the first phase during which there was a gradual buildup of violence. And then a significant change and a, a, a significant increase in violent activity towards the end of 1919 and the opening months of 1920, when the IRA started an all out assault on RIC barracks throughout the country. And for much of that, that second phase of 1920, there's a sense that the Republican movement was getting the upper hand on British policy. But then by about the summer of 1920, the British government finally gets its act together and responds with much more coercive measures, which in turn ignites a more radicalised final phase of the War of Independence between the autumn of 1920 and the summer of 1921. And I think that pattern fits very well. It, it reflects very well what was happening on the ground in Longford. The first slide here I have uh, relates to what I suppose is the first recognised engagement between members of the Irish Volunteers, as they still tended to be called in 1919, and the Crown Forces. This was an engagement between a few members of the Volunteers returning from an area at Ockham Cliff, where they uh, purely accidentally bumped into some members of the RIC and tried to disarm them. In the course of that engagement, one of the volunteers, Matt Brady, was quite badly injured. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to, uh, to put up this, um, these extracts. I'm, I'm aware these, I hope these are, are fairly viewable, but these are literally hot off the archives because these come from Matt Brady's pension file, which was just released during the week by the Irish Military Archives as part of the Military Service Pensions Collection. So if you're familiar with that collection and you want to read about this event in more detail, uh, you can download and peruse Matt Brady's files in, in, in much more detail. Um, so th this just this highlights uh, and he gives a very good account there of, of what happened. It wasn't planned in any way. This was was more or less a, a chance encounter, but it's, it's a, a landmark being the first encounter in which shots were fired between the members of the volunteers and the Crown forces. Now, the um, that slow escalation continued in Longford throughout 
1919. The local RIC county inspector in June reported that the Irish volunteers are showing signs of activity, especially around the northern part of the county. Towards the end of 1919, realising then that the RIC were becoming um, a bit of a target for the IRA and were, there were small RIC barracks in exposed rural areas, by the end of 1919, a, a number of these smaller RIC barracks in Smear, Larkfield, Abbey Shrewd, Balna and Killashi were closed. And then, it, but really the things start to get going in 1920. It, the, there's a noticeable change in early 1920 when uh, IRA general headquarters encourage IRA brigades in the county areas to start attacking RIC barracks. And we see that uh, put into effect almost immediately in Longford in January 1920 with the attack on uh, Drumlish RIC barracks on the 6th of January. Uh, attacks on RIC barracks continued throughout 1920. Um, in June 1920, the RIC were forced out of Balnamuk barracks. In August 1920, there were raids on the there was a raid for arms on the military barracks in Longford Town. Various other barracks in Arva were attacked as well in September. Just to to divert slightly from the going through the chronology of what happened to explain the reasons for this. The focus of the, RIC, uh, of the IRA and the Republican campaign generally in this period was on the RIC. Um, the RIC uh, as locally based, I suppose you could say the RIC were the most visible manifestation of British presence, of, of presence of British government in Ireland. Um, as local constables, they knew the ground fairly well, so they were a very good source of intelligence. The local constables would report up the line and then the RIC County Inspector would report up to the Inspector General of Dublin Castle. So they were a very important source of intelligence. Neutralising that source of intelligence was very important for the Republican campaign. But also the RIC, unlike the, the present Garda Síochána, were an armed police force. And the IRA didn't have all that many arms, so the RIC locally was a very good source of arms. Uh, and also at, at this time the, the Dáil had decreed the boycott or the social ostracization of the RIC. So what we're seeing here in the first half of 1920 is a coordinated campaign by the Republican movement to neutralize the RIC as an effective police or intelligence force in, in throughout Ireland. Um, another uh, key landmark, I mentioned the uh, Auckland Cliff engagement in April 1919 as, another, as a key landmark. Another key landmark came at the end of August when we see the first Crown Force fatality that the, with the death of, uh, of Constable John Mullen. Um, he was killed and three colleagues were ruined when the IRA raided a mail car they were escorting. Now, I'm not going to say too much about revolutionary deaths because that I, I'm going to leave that to Yunan in his paper later. Uh, uh, Mullen was the first RIC fatality in the county. However, he wasn't the first RIC officer in the county to be killed. Martin Clark from Lanesborough was killed in July 19, in July 1920, but he, he had travelled to Roscommon and he actually he died in Roscommon, so I don't include him as well as the first uh, fatality, Crown Force fatality in Longford. Of course, as I said, this, this uh, um, I suppose, military campaign against the RIC also coincides with the growing success of the Dáil Republican courts and their effectiveness in, in almost effectively replacing the largely the business of the Crown courts. So what you see throughout the first half of 1920 is a fairly successful assault on as, all aspects of law and order by the Republican movement. And eventually, by the late spring, summer of 1920, the British government uh, woke up to what was what was facing in Ireland. You could argue that for much of 1919, the British government took its eye off the ball in Ireland. There's very good reasons for that. They're, they're more concerned with the peace treaty negotiations in Versailles. They, they have all the problems to worry about at the end of the war and trying to resettle returning veterans. And there was also that unwillingness to recognise what was happening in Ireland was a war. They saw it as terror or a murder by the throat, as Lloyd George called it at one stage. But finally, in the summer of 1920, they wake up to the fact that they are facing um, a, a security challenges because of the success, a growing success of Republican attacks on the Crown forces. Um, they're facing, I suppose, existing legislation is not enough 
to curtail the Republican movement. And there's also a serious problem with who is running British policy in Ireland. The administrators in Dublin Castle quite simply were not up to the job, something about which one of our other speakers, Eunan O'Halpin, has written about in a lot of detail. Um, so what do you see then in the middle of 1920, which really ushers in the third phase of the War of Independence, is uh, the British counter response. In terms of security, they deal with the uh, assault on the RIC and the number of RIC men resigning and retiring by introducing the two uh, additional police forces, the, the Black and Tans from early 1920 and the Auxiliary Division of the RIC from the autumn of 1920. Administ complete overhaul of um, of the, the, the civil service in Dublin Castle and senior uh, British civil servants are brought in to try and get some order there. And in terms of strengthening the government's hand legislatively to deal with what he would see as sedition in Ireland, in August 1920, they enacted a, um, the Coercive Restoration of Order in Ireland Act. The impact of all of this significant British crackdown was to radicalise the campaign even further. The IRA were forced to uh, resort to the adoption of the uh, active service units and mobile flying columns. We see that evolve in Longford in the autumn, early winter of 1920. Uh, if you've had a chance to see Barney Sexton's recent talk, which is on Facebook, on the uh, the Battle of Ballon Lee, I think it's it's the best account you can find of the way in which the North Longford flying column evolved. Um, but what we see overall, in particularly around that time, November 1920, is the conflict moving to a much more violent phase. Nationally, we've got ev events like Bloody Sunday and Kill Michael. And again, that pattern's reflected very much in Longford with the um, the uh, the killings of um, the two policemen, uh, Peter Cooney and District Inspector Kelleher at, at the end of October and early November, and then the um, reprisal attacks on Granard and the attempted, uh, the repulsion, uh, by the successful repulsion by the IRA of the attempted uh, attack on Ballon and Lee as well. Um, I'm not going to go into those uh, some of those events because they have actually been covered in much greater detail by others in lectures in this overall series that the County Council is organising. As I said, Bar Barney's talk on the Battle of Valnity is, is the most comprehensive account you can find. And also, um, Sister may have introduced a very good um, uh, rereading of Father Butler's account of the burning of Granard as well. So I won't I won't go into um, huge detail on those events. What we see then towards the end of 1920 is the real is a is a serious concentration of Crown Force presence in Longford because the county is so um, disturbed, as the RIC would like to call it. Um, around the 4th of November 1920, there's a significant movement, a uh, deployment of black and tans to the county, but then much more significantly, I think, and, and in a recognition of how dangerous the Republican campaign in Longford has become from the British perspective, in December 1920, a newly formed M Company of the Auxiliary Division of the RIC was um, deployed to the infirmary in Longford Town. And the, 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 that period of December, uh, that period between, I suppose, the um, Balna Lee and Clonfin, if you like, November, December, January 1921, is a very intense and disturbed period in Longford, particularly in North Longford with the Crown forces in uh, occupation of Balna Lee for large parts of it. Another um, significant RIC fatality with the shooting dead of um, of District Inspector McGrath by Sean McKeown at Martin's Cottage in January 1921. So Longford goes into another a very intense phase of guerrilla warfare at this point. Um, and that which which really brings it's I, I see it kind of neatly bookmarked between uh, Balnally and Granard at the start of November and Clonfin in February 1921. Before I get to, I suppose, Clon Finn itself, I want to just move away now slightly from the, the chronology. I kind of set the scene of what's happening. But I think it's worth looking a bit at who we're talking about here. Who were these people who were combatants on both sides during this guerrilla conflict? And if we look first at the uh, the Irish volunteers or the IRA in Longford, and particularly, I suppose, the, uh, the group central to the execution of most of the 
IRA's engagements with the Crown Forces, the North Longford Flying Column. Um, in my, when I originally looked at this group, now this research, this was based on research which was conducted nearly 25 years ago, which is part from anything else makes me feel very old at this stage. Um, but in my, my original study of the North Longford Flying Column in the County Longford book, I think based on material related to pensions, which I found in Sean McKeown's papers, I think I estimated that there might have been about 600 in the volunteers, but I very much uh, had the caveat that, that all that could be was an educated guess. In the intervening period, we have had uh, uh, such a, a wonderful release of primary sources that I think that's, that figure certainly needs to be, um, uh, that figure for the strength of the volunteers, not, not the flying column, I should say, it needs to be revised upwards. Uh, in the piece I wrote on Longford for the Atlas of the Irish Revolution, I looked at the nominal roles for the Military Service Pensions Project, which set the nominal membership of the Longford Brigade at the time of the truce at 2,625. Now, I think that might be um, gilding the lily slightly. I think there might have been an effort there to include as many people who might at some point have expressed an interest in joining the volunteers or been involved at some point to include them in those roles. So it's it, it's very hard to say how many people were involved or were actively involved in the volunteers in Longford in this period. You're probably talking of something between a thousand and two thousand involved, but the number of activists is probably of, of those really involved in the intense period of activity is probably more in the, the hundreds. But that's not to um, dismiss the significance of what I call the rank and file. Uh, those who might not necessarily have been in the flying column, but nevertheless undertook very important ancillary services like uh, blocking roads to stop the Crown forces moving around and things like that. So that that's a question. Perhaps uh, I think Barney is on the is what is attending, so he might be able to help me out a bit there with his his own uh, Barney Sexton with his own uh, more recent research on it. But it, I think the figure has to remain up in the air. The, these organisations didn't go around keeping lists of who their members were at the time for obvious reasons. The, the other picture we get, and this, this relates more to the uh, North Longford flying column specifically, but I think they're fairly reflective of the volunteers as a body in the county. The average age is was about 25. Most of them were practising Catholics, and uh, I think continued that on the rest of their lives, and there are family members of some of the people I'm talking about here who can probably verify some of what I'm seeing here in this profile. At the time, most of them were unmarried, but it's funny how many um, family relationships were forged during this period with uh, volunteers marrying, say, sisters of fellow volunteers. McKeown's would be just uh, one example of that. Many of them had family collection, connections throughout the Republican movement. Uh, many had brothers who were also volunteers, sisters in common them on. If we look at some of the leading Republican families, that stand out, say the McKeown's, uh, Sean McKeown's brothers are in the volunteers, his sisters are in coming them on, the McGuinnesses politically in Longford Town, all Frank McGuinness's nieces were in coming them on, and of course Frank and Joe McGuinness were prominent in Sinn Féin, and the co their cousin Bridget Lyons was also active. So family connections are not unusual in uh, the Republican movement in this period. Most of the Longford IRA came from rural backgrounds. Now that's, uh, they couldn't have hardly have come from any other backgrounds given how the Republican movement was so strongly centered around North Longford. Now I think that's a, 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 a again, a point that I don't want to dwell on too much, but it's, it's maybe it's something that could come up in discussion afterwards is that very obvious division of activity and the strength of Republicanism in the Northern part of Longford, as opposed to the Southern part of the county. Uh, most, uh, of the Longford IRA as well were educated at least to primary school leaving level and were literate. And that's important because contemporary British portrayals of the IRA as unemployed, ill-educated uh, layabouts with nothing better, with time on their hands and nothing better to do but get into trouble, are easily put to bed by any serious analysis of the social composition of revolutionaries in Ireland. Um, so. I want to move on now to so that that's the that's our look at the um, at the combatants and who composed one side. Let's have a look at the other side because 
some of this already on the the social profile of the volunteers I've looked at in the book already. But what I want to use today to do is to explore some new research I've been doing, looking at who they were fighting against. And this was something that caught my imagination at the start of the year when there was all the controversy over whether or not the RIC should be commemorated as part of these this decade of centenaries. So I started looking a bit at the personnel of the Crown forces, uh, who they were and what it was that um, motivated them to join these forces and how, how they ended up where they did in driving across the tenders around back roads in Longford in 1921. The best estimate I can find from various sources of the strength of the Crown forces um, suggests that there are um, somehow in around probably 250 police of various source, various sorts stationed in the county at the time. This, these figures are, they probably need, I, I do need to do more work on them to confirm these, but this is the best I can find from sources available. Um, I, I, I also found an army figure back in um, in the history of the 5th Division, which covered Longford in the Imperial War Museum, which indicated that at the time of the truce, there were about 500 soldiers stationed in Longford. That's not necessarily to say there were always that number there, uh, but this is the best estimate I can find so far of what the strength of the Crown Forces in Longford was. Um, now, I want to look uh, a little bit at, our, uh, at the people again. And I mentioned a few by name already, a few uh, notable members of the Crown Forces. And I think it's worth just looking at a few of them in more detail. Um, I mentioned uh, Constable John Mullen, the first RIC fatality in Longford when he was, he was killed in August 1920. Now, we do have a tendency to think of the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries uh, at, at this period about the, the, the Irish IRA fighting these British ex-soldiers who were brought over to Ireland. I think we do need to pay heed to the number of Irish RIC who served in, who joined the RIC during this phase and who served in the RIC in some cases until disbandment. And this, um, I, I hope this slide is visible enough, but this is a, a screenshot from uh, Mullen's entry in the RIC register, where we can see that John Mullen was a Catholic, he was from Tyrone, um, and he joined the RIC on the 3rd of February 1920, and he was sent to Longford on the 1st of March. Um, so this was an Irish man, this was an Irish Catholic. He, he had to have known what he was getting into joining the RIC in February of 1920. Uh, we can see that his previous employment, he was a shipyard stager. So maybe this gives us some uh, help in trying to decide what, what on earth would a Catholic from Tyrone be doing joining the RIC at a time when he knew right well that he was going to uh, end up uh, engaging, probably engaging in military confrontation with Irish Republicans. Uh, Maybe, uh, as I say, he was shipyard stager. I doubt it was probably the best paid job in the world. So the, 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 uh, in order to entice men to join the RIC in 1920, the, the wages and the, uh, the conditions on offer were quite good. So I suppose this was a good job for somebody at a time uh, in the economic downturn after the war when good jobs were, were hard enough to come by. Um, I mentioned, I've also, the other two, um, screenshots I've included here are refer are come from uh, the Longford Brigade activity report. Now these are reports some of you may be familiar with. They were drawn up by brigade committees in the 1940s to assist the assessors of the military service pensions by putting together a list of all the engagements that uh, brigades were involved in. Now the Longford Brigade activity report, if anybody's doing research on this period, I have to caution in not being overly uh, trusting in the accuracy of this report. It was written over 20 years later and in some cases it is uh, verifiably inaccurate and this is a good example of it. Uh, they talk about the attack in which um, Mullen was killed and it says that three RIC were killed and two wounded out of a patrol of five. There is absolutely no evidence that three people were killed in this and in fact they, uh, the, the those who put the report together contradicted themselves because in a summary at the start of the report they say that um, one was killed and three were wounded. So, so, so. Uh, 
the reasons for that, we, we could speculate as the reasons for that. I personally, I think the fact that uh, it was easier to get a pension if you could prove that you're involved in a major engagement. If more than one person was killed, it's more likely to be a major engagement. That might have been an issue. It may just have been an error. But the main point I'm making is the Longford Brigade Activity Report. It's not the most reliable source for studying this period. The two key events, I think, which really got the the War of Independence brought it to a, a new level in Longford where the killings of the RIC District Inspector Kelleher in, in the Greville Arms Hotel in uh, Granard and then of Constable Peter Cooney on the France Road near Ballinalee the next day. And again, Kelleher underscore my point about uh, diver I think we have to look at the diversity of opinion within Ireland at the time. Yes, there was a lot of support for the Republican campaign, but there were still a lot of people in Ireland, including Catholics, who might have been considered to be more broadly nationalistic, who are still prepared to join the Crown forces and fight against the uh, the Republicans in this phase. And Kelleher is another one of those. Um, we see that he joined in, he was from Cork, he joined in... Uh, he joined the RIC in June of 1920 and he was transferred to Longford in August of 1920. He was an ex-army officer. So again, someone coming back to Ireland after serving in the First World War, probably finding it hard to, uh, to find employment. We have anecdotal evidence that Kelleher was certainly no friend nice. of the Republicans. So I think it's worth, it is worth reminding ourselves of that, that Support for republicanism mm. was by no means unanimous throughout Ireland and was by no means unanimous among the Catholic or broadly nationalist population. Uh, likewise, Peter Cooney was different to the two I've mentioned. Cooney, who was uh, shot dead by Frank Davis near Balnally, he was, he was different in that he was a long-serving RIC man. Um, he had joined the RIC in April 1902 and he had served in Longford from around the soon after his um, his marriage, I think he was, yes, you can see he was sent to Longford in 1913. He was based oh, in Galway and he married a Galway like, lady and then he was transferred. Obviously coming from London, yeah. Um, he was transferred to Longford in 1913. Um, now, why, we, we, we hear reports that um, Cooney was a bit of a thorn in the side of the local IRA. And again, I think it goes back to my point about the, uh, significance of the RIC and the reasons why the IRA wanted to neutralise this force. If Peter Cooney was based in, ba in Ballinalee around Longford from 1913, then he knew who the key Republicans were. He he would have been well placed to report to the authorities on uh, Republican suspects. So he certainly was a, a serious enemy in the eyes of the RIA, in the eyes of the IRA. Now, that, that's just a brief diversion into looking at these people. I want to go back slightly to our chronology of the War of Independence and the, the, the high point of Republican activity in, Long, in Longford undoubtedly comes in February 1921 with the, the Clonfin ambush. Um, and the Clonfin ambush really is the, it's the height of uh, Republican activity. I want to say a bit about the ambush itself. Uh, first of all, um, it is generally recognised as one of the um, classic, I suppose, uh, textbook examples of guerrilla warfare in in this conflict. Uh, we have the the use of the effective deployment of what we would now call an improvised explosive device. We have the uh, we see the benefit of a locally based guerrilla force using its own knowledge of terrain. Uh, we see uh, effective and the effective choice of an ambush site. When you come down the the, the bend and slide down that hill and round the bend, the, you can see even today, if you visit the site today, you can see how the auxiliaries would have been very exposed. Whereas when the, when you look up from the road, all you see is bushes and hills where the uh, the IRA could easily and did easily um, conceal themselves, so that when the Crossley tenders were forced to stop by the explosion. They were sitting ducks to be fired on. Um, what you're seeing there is what environmental historians of war would, would talk about uh, fighters using the natural environment as a natural ally during war. So it's a, it is a, it, it's a very good, just to study the ambush of itself, it's a very good example of successful em, em, employment of, of guerrilla tactics. 
But I, I want to look at the, uh, we're, we're familiar enough with the members of the North Longford Flying Column and the Longford Brigade who, who were carried out that. Um, we don't know as much about the 19 members of the Auxiliary Division of the RIC. That's the other reason I think that Clonfin is significant. All other engagements between the Crown Forces and the IRA in Longford are between the um, the IRA and the, the RIC, whether the regular old RIC or the TANS. What's significant about Clonfin is the uh, damage inflicted on the, the elite, supposedly elite auxiliary division of the RIC. I've identified 19 auxiliaries who were in those two crossly tenders. Um, in terms of nationality, I suppose when we think about where the uh, auxiliaries were recruited, it doesn't come as any surprise that most of them were English. There were two Scots, one Welshman, one Irishman, a, a Presbyterian from Leash, uh, who had been, who was an ex-soldier. Uh, All these men had had British First World War service, and one South African. Their average age was 26, so they weren't all that different from the uh, the men who they were facing on the other side. I suppose not too surprising given their uh, nationality. Again, most were Protestant. There were a few Presbyterians, one Baptist, and one of the Scots was a Catholic. What's significant is um, how little time they had spent in Longford at the time of the ambush. I mentioned earlier that M Company was deployed to the infirmary in Longford in 1920. Most of these 19 men didn't come to, weren't deployed to Longford until about after the 20th of December 1920. Some of them didn't come until January 1921. So they were tootling along on this back road between, uh, on their way back to Longford, having been involved around raiding in Lockdown and stopped for a few scoops in Granard. They were on their way back to Longford. They probably had, they had very little time to get the sense of the geography and the topography. Most of them had only been in the county uh, five or six weeks at the time. So they were very unprepared in terms of their experience. All of them had served in the First World War in some capacity. 12 of them were in the Army, five in the Air Force, and two in the Navy. And again, a, a point I want to highlight here is just how unprepared these men were for what they were facing in Longford in uh, 1921. Uh, what, what good was serving in the Air Force or the Navy for facing these guerrilla tactics in uh, in Ireland, in, in rural Ireland in 1921? Even those who'd served in the Army, their experience was First World War guerrilla warfare. So these men, while they might have had military experience, it wasn't the type of experience that fitted them to uh, be able to engage effectively with the IRA in Longford. I would single out two who had some experience, uh, ironically on opposite sides. Um, one of the older men, a man called Francis Boynton Lee, had served in the British Army in the Boer War. And another one, um, Van Eysen, who I mentioned later, the South African, had actually served on the other side in the Boer War. So at least they, had, they, they would have seen, they would have had some experience of guerrilla tactics. Linking these two points I've made about the successful use of a guerrilla ambush by the IRA and the unpreparedness of the auxiliaries in terms of their military experience and the length of time they were in the county, unsurprisingly, Clonfin was a serious uh, blow and in inflicted very uh, serious damage to the auxiliaries. Four of them died, three of them at the scene. Bush, yeah, it, John Houghton was killed first, I think, then Craven, the commander, and George Bush were killed at the scene, and Harold Clayton died, died uh, of blood loss two days later in Dr. Stevens Hospital. A total of eight of them were wounded in this engagement, seven of whom never served again. Seven of them were subsequently dismissed as medically unfit. Only seven of them were uninjured. Of those seven, only five were able to remain in the force until the RIC was disbanded in 1922. So if the whole point of the auxiliaries was to bring in this experienced military force to try and get a handle on uh, and, and suppress Republican activity, then it's something like Clonfin was a very uh, costly engagement for the auxiliaries. Um, 11 of them, 11 of the 19 never served again. Four died and seven were dismissed. They were, they were unable to serve a, a, again. So that's a, that's a very serious um, blow. And certainly the auxiliary, if we look at something like Plumfin, I think we would agree, I'd agree with some with, uh, in, um, analysis of Kilmichael and things like that, that um, uh, 
whatever potential the auxiliaries had, it certainly was not uh, not realised, and the the these uh, the losses in these ambushes were a serious blow to them. I want to look, though. I'm I'm interested by these some of these men who served in the uh, auxiliaries. I, I can't kind of get my get out of my head. How did these men who had survived the First World War? What was it that brought them to that road between? Uh, Balnally and Granard in the middle of the winter in 1921, where uh, four of them met their deaths. Um, and I think uh, it, it is worth exploring them in a bit more detail. And I found um, the Imperial War Museum's website, Lives of the First World War, has enabled me to put together a few more details about these men. The commander on the day was uh, was a, a career naval officer, Francis Worthington Craven. He was one of the oldest of the group. He was 31 at the time of his death. Um, for, in terms of family background, was probably on the slightly higher end of the social scale. His father had been a solicitor. He was a career naval officer, a very um, decorated one from the war. He had the UK. He earned the UK's Distinguished Service Order and the American Distinguished Service Cross for his bravery uh, during the war. But he resigned his commission. This was someone who probably would have stayed in the Navy even after the war, but he resigned his commission suddenly in April 1920, and the evidence would suggest he was in financial difficulties, and he was given he, he was allowed to resign in unusual circumstances, probably because of his storied career. They, they kind of let him off easily when he got into financial trouble. That gives us some indication as to why he might have joined the RIC. This was a career naval officer. He knew nothing other than serving in the forces. Suddenly he finds himself in April 1920 out on his ear and so the opportunity to get back into service comes up with the auxiliary division of the RIC, which he joined in December 1920. So I think looking at those aspects of his career gives us some insight into trying to answer this question of why it was that these men decided to join this force. Another of the fatalities on that day, um, John Houghton was more the, the average age. Uh, he was the, it, background wise, we, we think about the, we're often told that the auxiliaries were the elite force and that they were the ex-officer corps. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were, that their social background was as, uh, you know, as, as, as upper classes we might be led to believe and a lot of these actually were on the temporary commissions to the officer corps near the end of the war again he was he had a career um a career in a career arm sorry a, a full full-time uh, army service during the first world war and he joined the ric at the end of december so i mean he was only in longford between the 29th of december and the uh 2nd of February, you really would wonder how much time he got to get a sense of where he was or what he should be doing. Another of those who, Harold Clayton, the one who died in Stevens Hospital, um, again comes from a fairly modest background, army service in the war and joined another one of these RIC who joined in 1920. His wife's claim for a compensation, which was held at the quarter sessions and is reported in the Longford Leader in early 1921, at that she indicated that he sent back five pounds every week to her from his police pay of seven guineas, and that was to support her and the child she had at the time, and she was also expecting another one which was born uh, sometime after Clayton's death. That gives us an insight into why this man joined the uh, joined the uh, the auxiliaries. The Britain after the First World War was a place where veterans were finding it hard to find jobs and find it hard, hard to find well-paying jobs. So the fact that he could get he, this job came along, uh, seven guineas a week was, was very good pay by the standards of other uniformed services like firemen and things like that. So a job that enabled him to earn that money and send back that uh, amount of money to support his family, I think gives us a sense that a lot of these men joined up for uh, for financial and economic reasons. Um, just two more to have a quick look at Richardson. Thomas Richardson was one of the few to survive the uh, ambush and to survive the rest of the War of Independence and remain in the RIC until disbandment. Now, he was very lucky that he wasn't number five on the list of fatalities and the saving of his life is put down to the care uh, given to him, the medical attention attended to him by Dr. Keenan. Dr. Keenan and Dr. Vincent Delaney from Longford both attended the scene and were credited by the commanders of the auxiliaries in 
rendering medical attention, which in, in Richardson's case probably saved his life, and in the case of some of the others certainly um, ensured that their injuries were not as bad as they would otherwise have been. Unlike the others, uh, Richardson was a career soldier. He was in the army long before the First World War. He had served during the war, and he joined uh, he joined the RIC, stayed into demobilization. After that, again, he, he went back into the armed forces, joining the RAF. So you get the sense here of a man who probably knew nothing else in his life other than service. And if he was demobilized after the First World War and looking for a job, then uh, uniform service and the, the chance to serve in Ireland was probably an obvious course for somebody who uh, probably knew, knew no other occupations. The last one I want to have a quick look at and is by far the most exotic of the Clan Finn auxiliaries is this man, uh, Kadesh uh, Van Eysen, who was born in South Africa. Um, he's, he was born about either 1887 or 1889. Now, he's said to have Boer War Commander experience. And when I looked at his date of birth, I thought that seems a bit strange that he'd be only like maybe 10 or in his er at the most in his early teens at the time of the Boer Wars. But I'm told by uh, experts on the military experts on the Boer side that it was not unusual for younger boys to accompany um, some of the commando units as messengers and things like that. Um, so this was one man who probably more than any of the others understood the type of warfare that the IRA were uh, engaging in during the War of Independence. His background is much more interesting than any of the others. He taught for uh, he taught Africans in uh, an Anglophone school in South Africa. Um, he went back, he, he was a university graduate and uh, before First World War service was also a, a preacher in the Dutch Reformed Church, a very unusual character to end up in the RIC in Longford in 1921, I think we, we, we can say. Um, he, even though he had been on the, um, even though he, he had been on the, I suppose, the other side against the British during the Boer War, um, he joined the pro-British South African Armed Forces fighting first in German South West Africa and then transferred to Britain to the Air Force in 1916. In his, he saw he wasn't injured at Clonfin, but he was injured in a different engagement. And when he sought compensation from the courts, in through the courts in Longford, he was asked why he joined the uh, RIC, and he, he gave this hope that something would come out of it. Now I'm not entirely sure how to interpret that. Maybe he he felt that he could do some good for the British campaign. Uh, it, it's hard to know exactly what he means by that. Um, he uh, so. You'd be inclined to think that's why he joined, but I think this, there might be a bit more to his story because there's a record of him being divorced when he went back to, uh, he was divorced in Britain um, in 1921, so possibly he was, um, his decision to join the RIC was to get away from a, a domestic situation that wasn't uh, ideal for him. After he was discharged from the, uh, he was eventually discharged as medically unfit for injuries other than those uh, for, not, not related to Clon Finn, and he went back and spent the rest of his life in South Africa. Um, so that's just a kind of a, a view of these men, because I think it's it is just fascinating to see what it was that brought these men from so many different backgrounds to this point where they were engaging with the local IRA in 1921. And I think it gives us a good insight into um, other aspects of the War of Independence than just looking at it purely from the Irish side. I mentioned already, my next slide actually relates to something I've covered already, which is the uh, explanation of the suitability of the ambush site. And that, that's a, um, a photo I took of it, uh, managed to uh, avail of our uh, bit of respite during the summer to get down and take a few photographs of it. Uh, still, to me, the best analysis of the from the military side of it is John Carthy's essay in Tafia about for the 50th anniversary. So I won't go into it in great detail. But the points I'm making, if you can envisage two crossly tenders coming down that road, uh, and most of you have probably been to the site, so I don't need to explain it. But you can see how they when they came down there onto that flat part just how exposed they were uh, from uh, the uh, various IRA units uh, uh, positioned around the place to fire on them once they once they were forced to stop. Now, I've spent a lot of time here talking about combatants and talking about people, but I think it's important to move on and to remember that the only, um, the combatants weren't the only activists in the War of Independence. And I think it's important as well to remember other activists who might not necessarily have been involved in combat. 
And I think something that the new resources, particularly things like the military service pensions collection, has allowed us to explore in more detail is the role of women. But the experience of women generally, but uh, the role of women on the Republican side um, and the the quality of the um, pension applications from Longford is very strong in this regard. Um, the common men were not involved, were never involved in actual combat activities, but much of the combat activities, like the various assaults on RIC barracks and um, set piece uh, ambushes like Clonfin, could not have been carried out without the support services of groups like common men. Uh, Margaret McGuinness, who I mentioned earlier in her military service pensions gives a very good example of this. She talks about bringing money up to Dublin where she IRA to IRA general headquarters to, to buy revolvers, ammunition and grenades and bringing them back to Longford. Um, Sean McKeown uh, spoke about the importance of Common Naman, their significance. Common Naman first aid parties often travelled with the flying column when they went to, on engagements and he speaks particularly about the significance of common man in saving the life of Pather Conlon when he was injured in a, in an engagement towards the end of the War of Independence in mid-1921. From the end of 1920, when the volunteers ha were forced to uh, resort to their mobile flying columns, people like Sean McKeown and uh, Seamus Conway and Frank Davis and people like that, they couldn't go back to their homes because uh, it was well known who they where they lived. In fact, that's what, what led to the engagement that led to the death of McGrath. Sean McKeown was trying to visit his mother at um, Martin's Cottage and McGrath found out that he was there. Uh, when IRA men were on the run like that, they needed somebody needed to do basics for them, like bring them food and cigarettes and do their laundry and stuff like that. So coming them on uh, did a lot of that. They also provided safe houses when these men were not allowed to go back to their own homes. One of the most important activities taken on by coming them on generally throughout the War of Independence, but we see it specifically in Longford, was intelligence and communications. And one of the best examples, the best accounts of the role of women in uh, in, in the, uh, the Republican Intelligence Network is Michael Heslin's Bureau of Military History Statement. He was the uh, intelligence officer for the Longford Brigade. I was, even though, even before the Bureau of Military History be, was uh, released fully, I was lucky enough to get access to his statement when I was doing my PhD in my book. And of all of the statements of intelligence officers anywhere in the country, Heslin's is one of the best for explaining how Collins's intelligence network worked from the top level in Dublin and how it communicated then with the intelligence networks of the local brigades. And he singles out a number of women. He talks about the postmistresses and he talks about coming them on women like Mae Maguire, who um, she was quite young at the time. She just left school. So she nobody knows that this slip of a girl was going around carrying messages between um, local IRA units and things like that. So uh, I think it's important as well to recognise the um, the role of the the non-combat uh, units and coming them on in particular. Now, mentioning coming them on brings us on to a wider question of the female experience of guerrilla warfare generally. And not all women were in coming them on, and not all women were uh, supporting the Republican campaign. And we get examples of how women who are seen as uh, maybe disloyal or at least uh, not supporting the campaign or if not actively trying to sabotage the campaign, we get a good sense of how they were treated in Longford as well. Um, this is a, a claim for compensation which was reported in the Longford Leader in February 1921 of a woman called Kate Kelly who worked for the, she was employed as a domestic by the RIC in Longford, uh, in Lanesborough Barracks. And of course, the, the Dáil and the Republican movement generally were encouraging a boycott and a social ostracization of the RIC. Those seen as supporting the RIC, of working for them, of supplying with them uh, with goods and services, fraternizing them with any way, were likely to come to the unwanted attention of the Republicans. And Kate Kelly's experience here of having her hair cut off by the IRA was probably the most common form of punishment for women by either side during this conflict. Uh, Linda Connell, Professor Linda Connolly in Maynooth University has written quite extensively about this, but this is a very common form of punishment for women. Um, women tended, there was a reluctance when women were, expect, were, were suspected of spying or uh, in other ways trying to sabotage the campaign. There was certainly a reluctance to uh, 
inflict the ultimate punishment of killing them. One of the few examples there is Mrs. Lindsay in Cork. Um, and, and another, a, a good example also of that, of the IRA is uh, the, the need to stop people doing what they're doing, but the unwillingness to go so far as to kill women comes from uh, a Longford Bureau of Military History statement from Michael Murphy. Um, they had, for the, the local IRA had identified a female spy. Uh, they decided something needed to be done about her, but, uh, and I think the, the uh, layers of interpretation of this are, are fascinating. Everyone bought the shooting a woman, so it was finally decided to tr throw petrol on her and burn her. So I think from what he says beforehand with the truce intervening, she probably escaped that uh, pretty awful um, uh, potential uh, punishment. But again, I think these uh, these two examples speak to an emerging um, area of investigation within the War of Independence and the Revolution more generally of looking at the experience of women and at the nature and extent of violence experienced by women and why such women were the victims of violence. These are just two examples uh, that, that I was able to find locally. So the, while we're, we're moving here, for, I suppose, from looking at combatants, at fighters to civilians. So there's one other area of civilian activity that I want to talk about. And I think um, Paul Ross sort of uh, alluded to this in his um, brief comments at the start. And that's, I want to look at loyalists and Protestants who would not have been the natural allies of the Republican movement. Now, there's a strong... Uh, literature on this subject, as Martin mentioned, my own recent publications on Longford Protestants in particular, um, one of the most noticeable and significant demographic changes in 20th century Ireland was the decline of the non-Catholic population of the 26 counties that would become the Irish Free State between the two censuses of 1911 and 1926. And I've put the figures nationally that uh, across the 26 counties, that decline was in the range of one third. And I've put the Longford figures up there, and you can re really just need to look at the bottom line there. The population of Longford generally declined in this period. The Catholic population declined, but there is a much more greater level of decline within the three Protestant denominations. The non-Catholic denominations generally, again, if you put those three together and take them as a proportion of the overall population, it's in the uh, ballpark of the national figure of one third. The, Met the Presbyterian figure is much higher than either the Church of Ireland or the Methodists, and I think that comes down to the Presbyterians being much more highly concentrated in the Crown forces, so that when the army left and the RIC left, uh, that had a bigger effect on the Presbyterian population. The, there are, we're talking about a period between 1911 and 1926, we're talking about 15 years. There are so many reasons for this. Uh, emigration, uh, certainly before the revolutionary period, is very significant. Um, mixed marriages, but not in the way you might think. Mixed marriages in the, the desire to marry someone from within your own religion, which required you to move to another county where there was a bigger um, pool from which to choose, I think was important. The, the debate among historians of the Irish Revolution is really the extent to which during the years 1920 to 22, it was revolutionary violence which drove Protestants out of Ireland. And that's a very hard question. It's very hard to get a handle on that. Looking specifically at other statistics, things like the number of children attending the Sunday schools in Church of Ireland Sunday schools in North Longford, there certainly does appear to be a significant decline in the population between 1920 and 1922. So I think we can say that the revolutionary violence in those particular years had a significant effect I think it's more to do with 22 uh, and the start of the civil war, which is outside our remit. Um, it's not necessarily the case that there was an active campaign against them, but it may just have been the sense of uh, insecurity, which made some decide to leave. Now, of course, one key event that we have to look at in this uh, regard to this theme of the relationship of the IRA to the loyalist or Protestant community, where the, the, the shootings of uh, Willie Charters, uh, William Charters and William Elliot near Balnally in January 1921, both of whom were suspected of spying. Um, Sean McKeown's uh, version of events was that um, 
uh, and, and Barney Kilbrides too, uh, were the, 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 the Charters family, the, Willie Charters father and another family member had taken a dispute over land to Dáil Court. James Victory, who was the adjudicator of the Dáil Court, uh, went out to look at the land while he was doing that. As Sean McKeown says, young Willie Charters ran into Ballinalee and told the Tans that they came and um, arrested Kilbride and Victory. And that's Kilbride's version of it also. Now, I have heard some some um, scepticism expressed about this, that the Charters, who were loyalists because they were members of the local Orange Lodge. I've, I've, I've been able to check that with the records of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland here in Belfast. I've heard some scepticism expressed that the Charters would bring their case to a Republican court in the first place, but indeed they did, and the evidence for this exists in the National Archives of Ireland in the uh, the court books of the North Longford District Republican Court for the period, and we see this uh, the court sitting held on the 20th of August 1920, uh, Robert Charters of Garva and William Charters of Garva did bring a case over uh, the division of a farm of land to the Republican courts. So I think we can say that um, in this case, uh, apart all from the, the rights and wrongs of what the IRA decided to do to William Charters, that certainly um, what we're looking here is someone who was shot because of what he did, not because of who he was. Some, some historians will argue the Protestants were targeted because of who they were. Uh, in this case, I think it is a case of someone who was targeted because of what he did. Now, why did they, they go to the level of uh, taking the ultimate punishment against him? And why, knowing that, would he have done something so stupid? It is worth remembering that these are the first civilians shot dead by the IRA in Longford. So I think you must, if you, Willie Charters possibly did not understand the gravity of what he was doing, um, that, it, that he would pay the ultimate price for doing it. Um, so I think there's uh, there's an element of that in it. It's a, whatever way we look at it is obviously, it's a very difficult case to deal with. And I'm just trying to lay out the facts of it here. The impact of it, um, they, these, these were only two of, I think, it's about five or six civilians who were shot as uh, suspected spies. The others were Catholics, so I think there's no evidence here to suggest that there's a concerted campaign in any way against Protestants. Um, if it, Certainly it caused a lot of concern among Protestants. We have the, the local rector, and I know I'm, I'm running a bit over time here, so I'll try to finish up. Um, the local rector of Clonbrony, um, certainly in the inquiry into the death of Willie Charters, uh, talked about how um, he uh, how the um, he stated that the whole of the loyalists in the area were living in a state of terror and the Sinn Feiners did what they liked at night. Henry, did this same man, Henry Johnson, also in his Rural Dean's Report for 1921, attributed to, uh, population the loss of population in his parish to people leaving because of the troubled times. So the Charters' death, I think, did um, uh, scare local Protestants quite significantly. If the intention, well, I know Sean McKeown sent out a, a says he sent out a, a message to local Protestants that if they minded their own business, they would be fine and nobody would touch them. Um, I think if the intention in killing uh, Charters and Elliot was to send a message to anybody, whether I think Catholics or Protestants, what would happen to them if they spied, then I think that message was probably uh, heard loud and clear because there seems to be no other uh, problem with spies from within the loyalist community after this event. In fact, um, looking at some other documents from the period, at, at the time of McKeown's uh, court-martial and when he was under sentence of death, um, Henry Johnson wrote to Sir Henry Wilson, trying to get Sir Henry Wilson to use his good graces to help to, to reprieve McKeown from the death sentence. And in that letter, I think it's interesting that he says, I believe he has done his best in restraining his followers from extreme courses. So there are undoubtedly areas of the country in this period, but I think maybe more so during the Civil War, where there were events which appear to have had a sectarian element to them. Um, I, I can't say that about the Charters and Elliot event. That yes, they were Protestants, but I think had they been Catholics and done the same thing, they would have suffered the same fate as other Catholic alleged spies did. And, and I don't want to tread into Union's territory there. Um, but certainly I don't see this as um, as an example of a, any sort of concerted sectarian 
sectarianism against the Protestant population. Now, there, we do have some other evidence of hostility from among the Protestant population. And I think this is this is my second last thing I point I want to make. Um, this is actually a, a, a claim for compensation from the British government by a Southern, a, a loyalist from Edwardstown named Annie Neal. And she talks about why she her house was attacked in uh, by the Republicans uh, and her dressmaking business and was destroyed in April 1921. And she and her sister and her father moved to live in Portadown. Um, when writing to the British government and trying to convince them that she deserved compensation, she gave all these reasons why she was loyal. Um, her brother was in the Crown forces. Um, I carried out female searching for the forces. Uh, from my home, I carried food for the, the Crown forces she supplied. I was asked to do the same for D.I. McGrath, who's in charge of Ballon Lee District. Now, I have half a suspicion that if she had carried out any of these things, she would have got, uh, she'd have suffered maybe more than just her, her house being attacked. I have a suspicion she might be overplaying the extent of her loyalty there to try and get money from the British government. Now, as it happened, she didn't get any money, but purely because she was, re she was looking for a, a money for a time period that was outside the terms of reference of the Irish Grants Committee. I have a feeling she might be overplaying the extent of her loyalty there. Incidentally, there's a report in the Irish Times around the same time at, uh, of uh, the death of one of the um, black and tans who was shot in Longford in 1921, a man called Leonard Booth. And the Irish Times report it reports that Miss Neil was engaged to be married to Leonard Booth. So possibly uh, uh, that had more to do with the reason for the attack on her. Now, what I, I'm not sure if she knew this at the time, but Leonard Booth was actually married with three children. And when it, uh, back in England and when it came to uh, looking for compensation, his wife went to the courts in Longford claiming that he had deserted her. And his his mother also looked for the compensation. So it was, it was a rather the case of the two timing Leonard Booth, the two timing Tan is a very um, uh, complicated one. Now I've probably prattled on for long enough because I do want to leave people uh, time for questions, and I see some are coming in on chat. But I just want to I suppose I just want to finish up uh, by looking at where this all went to. I'm not going to deal with the civil war. I'll let I'll, I'll give Martin the opportunity to give us a chance to do a another conference in the Civil War, one hopefully which we will all be able to attend in person when things return to normality over the next few years. But one thing that strikes me about Longford, when you take into account just how intense the revolutionary activity was, is how fast things settled down. Um, and here's, an, here's just a still from a, a, a newsreel footage, and I've put the link up there so people can look at themselves, of the war memorial being unveiled in Longford Town in 1923. Union Jack, loyalists uh, all over, everywhere. I mean, it might as well have been uh, a Remembrance Day scene uh, from uh, Westminster last Sunday. But that happened. Now, obviously, Republicans didn't. Um, those who had been on the Republican campaign were not involved in it. But there was no effort to stop this. Um, there was no great opposition to it. It went ahead unmolested a very short time after the, the hostilities that we're talking about today ended. So what strikes me about Longford is how fast peace returned and how fast things went back to normality. And to go back to people like my discussion of Protestants, I think the reason a number, I think we've put a lot of focus on why the population declined. I think it's worth also looking at the ones who stayed and remained, decided to stay in Ireland. And I think the the, the speed with which peace returned uh, in 1923 was a significant factor. And finally, uh, on this uh, question, I suppose, of legacy and where things went afterwards, I think it's worth some of the scars of conflict. And again, I was glad to hear Paul Ross uh, mention this in his um, opening remarks because it, it, it was something and he, he, he wouldn't have known how I was going to speak about today, but it speaks to a point I wanted to raise, which I think we need to spend more time looking at what happened at the experience the later experience of people as a result of this time. And I have another extract here just from the Longford Brigade Committee, and I, I just think it's very poignant. This is a list of, of volunteers who were involved in a particular engagement. And the last one, and they give the, the address of the people in, in the 1940s. The last one there, John Lavely, now an inmate of Mullingar Mental Hospital. 
I think that's something the, the material contained in the military service pensions collection is giving us, is allowing us to have an insight into what we would now accept that post-traumatic stress disorder emerging from conflict. That's an area of investigation from the Irish Revolution that we need to do a lot more to understand the impact of these events on the people involved in them at the time. Similarly, on the uh, Crown Forces side, there's a report there from 1939, which uh, of the apparent suicide of David Wainwright, who was the commander of M um, Company of the uh, auxiliaries in Longford Infirmary. Not the nicest, nicest character in the world from uh, some of the reports in recently released pension files. But one that kind of, I think, jumped out at me when I saw it in the National Archives in Dublin a few years ago, and it's an aspect of the legacy of the War of Independence that I have to say I never thought about. This is an affidavit submitted by Dorothy Laurel Booth, one of the daughters of the said uh, Leonard Booth, and she's applying to the circuit court in Longford in 1941 on her reaching the age of 21 for the payment of the money held in trust there for her. When her father was killed, um, compensation was set aside for his then wife and his three children, and they were entitled to get that money from the Irish courts on reaching uh, majority when they became 21. And I, I just, I was trying to think of what it must be for this girl who grew up without her father. She mightn't have seen him anyway. I mean, if he had deserted his wife, he might never have been seen again. But she probably didn't know where Longford was. And here she is writing to the courts in Longford, looking for the money which they have held in trust for her for uh, for 20 years after her father's death. So I suppose I want to know, I know I've gone on probably for um, for longer than I had intended to, but I just want to make, I suppose, um, just get a few, um, make a few very quick comments drawing all this together. I think this centenary of the revolution is a wonderful opportunity to examine in much greater detail the wider context of events of 100 years ago. We undoubtedly primary sources, the availability of primary sources, even in the 25 years, when I did the Longford book 25 or so years ago, there were a lot of sources, but what has become available in the meantime is staggering. Um, so I think I, I need to update uh, quite a bit of it and, and look at in new areas. Um, so that we, we really have the resources to do this, but I think also time. A lot was done in Longford 50 years ago to commemorate the 50th anniversary and some very good work was produced. But I think the, the further time remove, the extra 50 years, and looking at this now from the remove of 100 years, allows a sufficient distant, distance for a more dispassionate approach to looking at this undoubtedly seismic, but also difficult time in our past. And I think on that note, I'll finally stop speaking and allow people to come in with, um, if Martin wants to moderate a few of the questions from the chat.